Hello and good afternoon, everybody. I hope you're well and I hope you've had a wonderful day so far. Um, thank you so much for joining us for this afternoon's session on Cracking the Conversation Code, where we will talk about how to have those uncomfortable conversations in the workplace. Um, we really want this to be interactive, so pop questions in the chat, um, really ask questions, share ideas, thoughts and everything. We really want you to feel like you can be involved in this session with us today. Um, so my name is Gabby, I am co-founder of Diversity Ally and we help industries become more diverse and inclusive in their people, culture and image. And we do this in a number of ways through education and workshops like this, um, through consultancy, through organisational assessments and through events such as our um, virtual roundtables, networking breakfast and diversity events awards. Um, and I'll let my um, uh, co-founder Ashanti introduce herself. Good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, depending on where and when you watch this. <laughs> uh, we're really pleased to be here. My name is Ashanti. I am the other half of Diversity Ally, and uh, we will be taking you through cracking the conversation code in this session. Okay, so Gabby. Yeah, brilliant. Um, next slide, please, slide three. Oh, yes, I'm doing the slides. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> um, so, a little question for you here. Um, do you enjoy a good conversation? And what makes a good conversation? Um, if you could share some thoughts or ideas in the chat, that would be fantastic. And really, Gabby, our thought process, we, we're always having chats, right? The majority of our work is conversation-led. Yeah essentially yeah. um and we get that these conversations might be uncomfortable at times about diversity and inclusion but ultimately there are things that make us enjoy a conversation or remember it hopefully for positive reasons yeah. <laughs> uh you know what kind of makes a good conversation for you or are there things that you know, for you, make a conversation maybe unpleasant or uncomfortable, for example. Do tell us in the chat function. I think for me, I'll, I'll kick off with what makes a good conversation for me, whether it's with anyone, with anyone whether it's with friends, um, whether it's with colleagues, whether it's with family. I think it's when you feel like you go a little bit deeper Okay. And yeah, when you're talking on a level and there's real honesty coming out and you're getting deeper into something, and the deeper you get into a conversation, the more honest you are, the more connections I feel that I make. Yes. From, from my perspective, what makes a good conversation? Yeah. Do you know what? It's interesting that you say that, actually, because that's a really good point. It is about feeling, I guess, like you've understood somebody a bit more. Mm. And you also feel understood when you come away from the conversation as well. I think that's really quite a good point, actually. So, yeah, my one was the set. It was similar where I feel understood, essentially. Um, and a good conversation is when we seek to understand each other. So what are we going to be talking about then this afternoon? Gabby, over to you. OK, so... Um... Today's session, we're going to be looking at how to approach difficult conversations with colleagues, um, how to overcome internal resistance to receiving feedback, um, and how to use conversations to get better understanding of our colleagues' lived experiences. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Gabby. So you might be wondering, OK, there's two ladies from Diversity Ally. This is a talk that might be about diversity and inclusion. Why are we talking about conversations? So this is a tough conversation. It's a broad conversation as well. So depending on your job role, your lived experiences, who you work with, who you talk to, diversity and inclusion could mean a myriad of things to you in that context. But here's the thing. Regardless of exactly what the conversation is about, we do need to know how to have a conversation in a productive way. Thank you, Anna, for sharing. Um, good conversation is when people are talking on the same level, not from authority. Yes, yeah, absolutely. And it's really interesting that you brought that up, Anna, because we're going to be talking about conversation code. You probably think it's a bit cheesy because you probably work with <laughs> or around code all the time. <laughs> uh, but we kind of thought that could be this could be a good way of framing the conversation mm. around code essentially right um how can we make this easy to remember easy to use and it become a habit the way code can help us do things repetitively 
over and over again. How can we get ourselves into that frame of mind when it comes to hearing, engaging in, participating in conversations that might be uncomfortable, um, that require us to see somebody else's point of view, maybe understand something that they have experienced that we can't necessarily relate to. So that's what we're talking about when it comes to conversation code, okay? So here we go. Now, it's really interesting to maybe start by thinking about what stops us from having a good conversation. Anna, you picked up on that well, when we don't feel maybe like we're respected in a conversation, mm. like it's not a peer-to-peer -peer conversation, an exchange, an equal exchange, um, when we may feel like the other person is not trying to understand us or even listen to us. Mm. Yeah, and I think trust comes into that quite a lot as well because if you don't feel safe within that space that you're talking in it makes it a lot harder to share ideas and thoughts so there's got to be that element of trust there as well absolutely exactly um tell us what stops you sometimes from having a conversation with somebody that you might not be looking forward to or might make you feel a bit uncomfortable <laughs> what is it about that person or indeed um what is it about the topic that makes you feel uncomfortable? Yeah. Um, and so uh, this is a really interesting thing to start thinking about. Now, just to give you some idea and some prompts, bias. Okay. So often the attitudes and beliefs and ideas that we might have, that we might have been taught, uh, that we truly believe are right, sometimes those are actually biased. OK, which means they lean one way without much maybe qualification or challenge. And actually those attitudes and beliefs might actually be making somebody else feel uncomfortable or maybe disadvantaging that person in the workplace, in our space, in our community and in our society. And because we're all humans, we all make mistakes. We can only but develop based on what we've been taught, or what we think we know what we think is right, we can all be biased. We can all be biased. Tell us how that makes you feel to consider that maybe some of your ideas or beliefs about people, about things, about different cultures may not actually be right. They might be biased. We can see some questions yeah. and comments here. Yeah, so we, um, we have um, a sharing here. It stops me if we don't get progress or the same understanding anymore. Line talking without listening to each other. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's also true. We're always keen as humans, aren't we, to um, get our ideas across and our thoughts and opinions across and make ourselves heard and understood. And one of the key like, elements we've drawn on this, Stefan, is that the listening skill is actually probably a lot more important than um, being able to express your thoughts and feelings. So, yeah, that's, um, that's a really good point to share there. Yeah, it is. And also, Stefan, where you've talked there about um, it stops you, what stops you is if you don't feel like you're getting progress yeah. or the same understanding. We're going to touch upon that later because sometimes it's a different way of thinking about things that sometimes the conversation might not result in progress mm. but it's still the value of having the conversation itself mm. so that's something that as humans really honest there stuff and that if we don't feel like we're going to make any progress or anything's going to change we might not want to talk about it mm. <laughs> essentially um but what we're going to talk about is the value in still having the conversation even if we don't get what it is that we would like or our best outcome mm. um let's still have a conversation about this. Thank you for sharing, Stefan. I can also see that uh, Yashika, how, um, to make a com how to have a conversation to know more about our senior colleagues' lives without making them feel uncomfortable about sharing it uh, with the intention to learn from their experiences and mistakes. Yeah, mm. that's a good one. Let's go through some of the codes then that we came up with to share with you that might actually help and answer that question about how you can have a conversation, how you can ask questions without making people feel uncomfortable. Okay, so here we go. Code one, curiosity. 
I guess that's what you're really asking, Yashika, isn't it? If you're curious about someone or something, how do you start a conversation or have a conversation that makes them feel comfortable? So here's the thing about this particular code, curiosity. If we don't come into conversations with an openness, a willingness to learn and to understand something or someone, it can shut the conversation down before we even get started. If we come into a conversation with just wanting to say what we want to say and not really hear the other person, then we lose this curiosity piece and we shut the conversation down. And if a conversation is new to us, new to the person we're talking to, the conversation is maybe even controversial, there might have to be some tension, there's difference of opinions, we have to try to remain curious, remain open to learning about that person's views and why they feel the way they feel. Okay, now Yashika, something practical you could do is be open and transparent about why you're asking the questions. So quite often we get asked the question and we're not sure why, what the intention is, what the motivation behind the question is. But if we have a question, we can say, um, I'd love to know more about you. I'd like to learn from uh, your experience. I'm trying to avoid making mistakes myself. I'd like to develop in my role. I'd really appreciate, given your years of experience, if you could share with me how you got here or what tips or advice do you have? Um, what things have you tried before that may not have worked? Um, that you're willing to share with me so I can avoid making those mistakes too. Do you see? It's about that curiosity, but maybe being more open and transparent about where your curiosity comes from, because then you provide a psychologically safer place for a senior colleague or a manager to share with you, to share um, those mistakes, to share their advice and experiences. I hope that's helpful, Yashika. Okay, so curiosity is important. We often get to an age in life where we're told not to ask questions anymore, <laughs> uh, essentially. But actually, when it comes to having uncomfortable conversations, conversations about differences, conversations about who we are and how we experience life, curiosity can be really useful can be really, really useful. Do let us know if you have any questions about curiosity, okay? The second code is keep it factual. So have you ever shared something with someone, a really deep maybe experience, something that happened to you that wasn't pleasant and they maybe dismissed or ignored what you said, or maybe they said to you, are you sure that happened? Maybe it was just a bad day. How did that make you feel? How did it make you feel when you had that conversation? So this is the thing, if we can find a way of staying or keeping to the facts when we need to approach a colleague, um, approach a peer about something, that we may have experienced or that they have experienced. If we can ask questions like who was there? What happened? When did this happen? happen? Were there any witnesses? Keeping it factual in the beginning of the conversation helps us to reach a common ground. It helps us to agree on a set of facts. And after we agree on this set of facts, we can then maybe add in, well, this is how I felt. This is the impact that that thing had on me. Can you see how useful it is to start from a place of fact? Because if the experience that I'm sharing with you is completely new, or if it's a conversation that's completely new, it gives you a chance to get up to speed on the facts and understand, see why uh, this might be important to me in the first place. Does that make sense? Do pop any questions that you have into the chat function and we can absolutely answer any comments even, okay? Any comments even, because 
or when something has just happened to us, or maybe it's been happening for a long time, we can feel very invested. We might have more emotions, frustration, anxiety, sadness, all of these kind of emotions. And so when someone finally asks us, tell me about your experience, tell me how you feel, we overspill very naturally as humans with our emotions. But if we're in the context of a workplace with a manager or with a peer, for example, often the managers or colleagues are in go mode. So they're just listening for the facts, basically. I'm busy. I just want to hear the facts. And that can feel then sometimes like someone's disinterested, they're dismissive. But actually what we can do is approach the conversation with some facts so that we can meet in a common place. And it gives your colleague or your manager an opportunity to get up to speed and understand why this might be important to you, why this might be a conversation that they need to engage in a little bit more. Okay, so this is a really key piece of the code that can help us to have uncomfortable conversations, conversations that have conflict in them, conversations where we're a new learner, we're new to the conversation. And right now in the world, there are lots of conversations that are happening for the first time on a global public scale. And we might not be versed in them. We might not really understand all of the, the conversation. We might not understand why this matters even. How does this apply to me? How does this relate to me and what I do? What does this have to do with technology? What does this have to do with my job? Why is this talk being featured? on this <laughs> platform, in this conference, in the first place. But understanding the facts goes a long way to helping us appreciate why something could matter to someone. Yeah, so um, this is a really good comment, Stefan, about sometimes people's reactions. Maybe they're angry or they come across as angry if their fact is questioned, even if you're trying to be objective. Yeah, so this is really interesting, Stefan. This is a good, you brought up a brilliant point, okay, about interpretation of fact, okay? When we're talking about people's experiences, we have to be able to give them space and honor that experience even if we believe that they've interpreted something in a different way to the way we would have. Okay, so there are individuals and groups of people who do experience things that can be difficult to express. And we might not perceive that to be factual, we may perceive it to be a perception or an experience or an interpretation. And that makes it quite challenging sometimes for us to engage in healthy conversations. I appreciate that. But, you know, it's really important where we can, when someone's sharing an experience in the workplace and outside of the workplace that we don't understand, we don't relate to, and potentially, yes, we disagree with their interpretation of that experience. It's still quite important to help the conversation keep going, to stick and start with the facts first, try to understand where they're coming from, and then take it from, from there. I really appreciate you bringing up that point, Stefan, because it is such a common one. You know, we may feel like we're trying to stay objective, but at times that could present to other people as if we don't care, as if we're dismissing their feelings, okay? So it's, it's something that both parties in the conversation need to be aware of, really. Um, Yes, exactly. So I see a comment in the comment section about allyship. So yeah, part of supporting other people is listening, understanding what they're going through in terms of listening to what they have experienced, even if we don't always understand or relate to it. But we can try. We can try here. So this is code two, keep it factual. Okay. So keep it factual. If you're the one addressing the conversation and Try to lean into the facts if you're the one being approached in this conversation. So this is an interesting one, uh, Gabby, isn't it? The right participants. <laughs> <laughs> so quite often a conversation can go very wrong if the wrong people are having it, essentially. 
okay? If the wrong people are there, this can go wrong. Um, <laughs> uh, and sometimes, you know, we come out of a conversation thinking either that was a waste of time mm. or that didn't go the way I hoped it would go. But often if we think about this third code and we ask ourselves, should this have been a one-to-one -one conversation or a group conversation? Mm. You know, there are some conversations we need to have on a one-to-one -one in a private discreet place and other conversations, they're okay to be had in wider forums. Mm. This conversation right now is happening on a, on a wider forum. Okay, because we're talking through how to have healthy conversations, conversations that are uncomfortable about differences and different lived experiences. But maybe, for example, if one of you were sharing a very personal experience, you wouldn't necessarily put it in this chat box function. You would seek a safer place, a more discreet place with the right people, someone who could help you, for example. So in the workplace setting, if you've experienced something with another colleague that wasn't pleasant, which person should you be speaking to about this? How should you approach them? Do you say something in the breakout area in front of everyone at your desk? Or it may be better to take them aside into a breakout room, into a meeting room and have that conversation. So it's really about understanding who the right people are to be a part of the conversation at the right time. Okay, so that's the third piece of code that can help you be successful when it comes to having healthy conversations, is make sure the right people are in the room at the right time. Okay. Please feel free to keep sharing your comments. And yes. Um, I'm here to, <laughs> to respond to you, so do keep sharing. So, Anna, Anna, that is a brilliant point. I'm afraid we can't always pick the partners for a necessary conversation. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Sometimes something happens in that moment. And or sometimes we respond very quickly. And yes, sometimes we might not have access to the right people at that time to have that conversation. So there is something we can do, which is actually the fourth piece of code, okay, for conversations, healthy conversations, reflection. Now, what we might have to do, Anna, depending on what, and I'm actually interested, Anna, tell me what you mean by we can't always pick. Do you mean you can't reach them, can't access them? Or do you mean you, um, uh, sometimes a conversation just happens and then you realize after that this could have been the wrong person to have the conversation with? Mm. I'm really interested, aren't we, Gabby, in what you actually mean <clears throat> in that instance. Because if something's just happening or happening in the moment, maybe it won't be possible to choose who we take the conversation to. So maybe. In in that situation, um, we maybe don't engage in the conversation any longer. We go away, we reflect and think about on what we need to say, who we need to speak to and who needs to be involved in that conversation. In other instances, we might be able to address it in the moment. If a conversation about difference is happening or someone's expressed an opinion that we might find offensive or you think is alienating to even some of your other co colleagues in the workplace, mm -hmm. Context is definitely everything. I'd appreciate it, Anna, if you did share with us what you mean by not being able to pick the partners for a necessary conversation. Is it that maybe senior management aren't always available and accessible? Maybe they don't have an open door policy? Is it that when you do approach them to have a conversation that they're not that open really to feedback in reality when you try to have the conversation? <laughs> because that can happen. Okay, so um, that the fourth piece of code is reflection. And then the fifth piece is the feedback loop. So when we're approached about something that might be sensitive or might be unpleasant, might be a problem, where a colleague or someone we manage is feeling um, you know, uncomfortable or was offended by something that is happening in the workplace or was said, we have to be open to that feedback. We have to be able to take feedback, 
ask more questions and understand where it is that they're coming from. So I can see Anna and everyone that you you really want some advice really on allyship and how we can take this conversation code into the real workplace environment and get some changes. So let's answer a couple of your questions before we get deeper into talking about uh, diversity. So how do we recruit the right people? How do we get people to become allies? So in answer to your question about allies, this conversation code is very key, okay? Because allyship looks differently to different people. It can be small acts, it can be big acts. But here's the thing, if we can't have productive conversations, it's really hard for an individual to know how to support you and then go on to support you. So using this conversation code where possible will enable individuals who want to support you in the workplace to do that because they will be able to open up conversations potentially in spaces that you're not a part of. That could be a management meeting, a board meeting, that could be you know, on a team or in a campaign where something is being produced that might impact you or other marginalized groups, women, uh, disabled persons, individuals of different uh, sexualities or gender identities. So in order to become an ally, we have to use this conversation code, the principles of it, to understand what the problem is and understand how that individual or group would like us to support them. Do you have any other comments, Gabby, I know on that point about allyship? I think you covered it pretty well there, Shanti, actually, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I'm concentrating on responding there, so. <laughs> yes, no, that's okay. And Anna, um, thank you, first of all, for sharing your experience. It is incredibly difficult to share experiences, especially in public forums, um, you know, and I can appreciate that at times we may have spoken up before uh, about uh, you know, things that we don't think are right, um, especially if we are personally affected by them. Mm. Um, and it's very common to go to a superior and not receive the response that we're looking for. Okay, that is also very common. So I'm sorry that you had that experience, first of all. And secondly, yes, in that circumstance, his superior was not open to feedback, as we're talking here about healthy conversations. His superior didn't reflect on what you shared, and they certainly didn't maybe gather the facts with you to be able to honour and hold space for your experience and then go on to make changes and do something differently. Mm -hmm. So here's a question that Yashik has asked, which I think is somewhat related to your question, Anna, which is how do you identify the right person to ask feedback from? Mm. So this can be really um, challenging, to be honest. How do you choose the right person to have a conversation with about something that you're experiencing or you're concerned with, or maybe you are passionate and want to be an ally yourself for diversity and inclusion, in your workplace um, and sector. Mm -hmm. So within the workplace structure, for example, there are stakeholders who are responsible for the well-being of everyone. So again, it's about looking at who those stakeholders are. Is that a manager? Is that your manager, a different manager? Is there a HR manager, a human resource manager? I know it might be called something different in other parts of the world. So is there an individual that looks after the well-being of people? Okay. They often are hopefully a good person to approach about this kind of matter. Now, what you want to do usually is gather your facts approach that person and choose a time or context that could aid the conversation. So maybe it won't be appropriate to approach them in a general networking area or breakout room. Maybe very practically speaking, it's about finding a pre-scheduled time, a pre-scheduled time for a conversation with them. Start the conversation by saying how you, why you're there. What is it you want to get out of the conversation? Why are you having the conversation? And also why you've chosen them to have the conversation with. Now, what that does is it 
lets them into where you're coming from, your intentions and motivations, but also helps them understand that you have chosen them really and shown some trust to share this experience with them. Okay. And that often is a healthy foundation to start a, you know, a conversation on, especially if it's a challenging conversation. And then hopefully, hopefully they hear what you're saying. Now, if they're not the right person, they should express that and say, look, thank you for sharing with me. I may not be the right stakeholder. So-and-so is the right person that you'd need to speak to about this. Okay, this is why it's so important that we all have these conversations, managers, uh, mm -hmm. senior leaders, all of us, regardless of our level of seniority within a company, because we all might find ourselves in a situation where we're hearing an experience that's unpleasant that we also need to uh, process and um, then act upon. I don't know if you have any thoughts there, Gabby. Yeah, I'd also add add on to that as well, on an individual level, I think identifying yourself as an ally will make people more comfortable to come forward and then yes. speak to you, essentially, if you yes. are able to assist them or pass them on to somebody who is able to, to help them. So if we identify ourselves in these roles to our peers and our colleagues, yes. well, it means that we can start pushing um, how we need to speak to people through the right channels if we can't, I guess, reach the person directly who initially wants to have a conversation with. So absolutely. Yourself as allies. <laughs> yeah. No, absolutely. And that's a brilliant point, Gabby. You know, uh, the more approachable we become, the better we become at having these conversations when our colleagues and our peers see that we're good at having these conversations. They, they are more likely to approach us, essentially, when they have something to share. And, you know, it, it, it's not easy when you've experienced something, you know, very similar or the same as what Anna has expressed. Mm -hmm. And it can feel very demoralizing when we have gone out of our way to express that to someone we think has a responsibility, has some accountability to help us, and they have disappointed us and maybe even let us down. That isn't easy to, to deal with. And no one should really have to be dealing with that sort of thing alone anyway. You know, you shouldn't have to have that weight on your shoulders. You should be able to gather your friends, your allies, your peers around you to support you in that and not yes. have to deal with it by yourself as well. So, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And it appears as if, just based on the information you shared, mm -hmm. Anna, that maybe his superior hasn't been using some of these codes, mm -hmm. right, of being able to conduct conversations uh, that are productive conversations whereby he can you know act as an ally to you in that conversation and, and also think about what further actions may or may not be necessary in that particular context can you see then why these principles can be very useful but they're very important for helping us to resolve conflict around issues that are related to diversity, whether that's gender diversity, racial diversity, disability inclusion, the list goes on, really. Unless we're able to have better conversations in the workplace, we won't see the changes that we're all hoping for. I'm just checking the chat function again. See what questions we have. Yeah, having someone with me might have been a good idea in this situation. Yeah, we, we all do that. We all kind of think we can handle ourselves and we can handle it by ourselves. But yeah, having that backup or somebody who just knows what happened and the situation that happened is um, a little bit of kind of support for you. Yeah, it's really useful. Absolutely. Don't beat um, yourself up about <laughs> approaching this no, at all. Don't. And this is the thing. It is an ongoing practice. Sometimes we get it right. Sometimes we get it wrong. Sometimes we look back and think, I could have done that better or I wish that was possible. Uh, something that Gabby said that's really crucial is about taking someone with us at times. Uh, do we need to have these conversations all the time by ourselves? No. We talked here about code three, the right participants. So sometimes that could be taking a third party in to a meeting with us that can support us during that meeting. Or when we talked about gathering the facts, who was there? Was there a witness? Is there somebody else that we can also um, take into a conversation with us? So that's a brilliant point there, Gabby. And yes, Anna, 
um, having someone with you uh, may have provided more support. Um, if we want to continue this conversation, absolutely. So you can find Gabby and I um, on LinkedIn. You can find us on um, LinkedIn. We'll just scroll to the last slide there. This is where you can find Gabby and I. You can drop us an email directly. You can find us on LinkedIn. You can pop onto the website because the website has a completely free guide as well as a podcast show where you can listen um, to different episodes about how we have um, conversations about diversity and inclusion that are really productive. Mm. There is also, and um, I'm not sure whether um, this slide will be shared, but there's also a link as well where you can download some further resources as well, Ava. So, yeah. Um, so either way, message us on LinkedIn and we'll send it over to you. Or if you get these slides, you'll be able to download it directly as well. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and so maybe, Anna, um, let's see what we can do to look forward, really. How can we improve these conversations because ultimately these conversations are still going to happen they have to happen unfortunately we can't avoid uncomfortable conversations forever <laughs> you know um unfortunately it's going to take time and it does take time for our environments and the cultures that we work in to change where maybe people are treated um more equally regardless of their differences as human beings so how can we improve our conversations about race and our conversations um, about gender, for example, but specifically about race. Now, why are we even talking about this? Uh, this year, more than ever, conversations about race have been happening on social media, in the media, in general, and in a way that's never really happened before. And before now, individuals didn't have permission, okay, to talk about race without repercussion or without fear or anxiety in the workplace setting. The problem though with all these conversations happening on social media and in the media is that those conversations aren't within a context and so we can't always process or ask more questions when we have them. And so part of being able to have a healthy conversation is being open to listening to what others have to say. So if you're wondering why is race being discussed to the extent that it's being discussed all over the world, or maybe you're thinking, I don't see any issues with race around me, or I don't think this is relevant to the job role that I have or to my organization. Well, race is important because it is a difference at times. And unfortunately, some groups within the workplace, some groups within uh, this sector, may not feel as comfortable as included. There may not be enough representation. So you may not work with a lot of people of different races. You may, you may not. Maybe you've never had a manager of a different, who, who is of a different race before. So here are some tips really about how we can use what we've learned about having uncomfortable conversations when it comes to talking about race. Um, Gabby, you're always really good at talking about a couple of these, actually. The one about listening in particular. Um, yeah, sure. So I think it, it is a, a, a skill, a real skill to learn how to listen. And that sounds strange that we need to learn how to listen, but it, it is a skill. It doesn't come naturally all the time to, to people. Even for those who are, say, um, less extrovert or more introvert, even then, um, even as an introvert, it doesn't mean that you're um, a skilled listener. So I think a lot of the times it's about letting the person speak and share and then giving yourself some time to reflect before then responding and choosing the way that you want to respond. Um, as Shanta mentioned earlier, with regards to things like biases, we can all often jump to conclusions about what somebody actually means when they could be meaning something different. And that's another, an, another key as well, I think, to that is if you're not sure, you don't understand what somebody is mean or meaning or trying to refer to, is to really dig in and ask them again to explain a bit further so you can get a real deep and better understanding of what they're trying to convey. Um, I'd say those those are the key things. I always have to take a pause before I want to jump in and speak about something and just make sure I've actually heard somebody properly and not digested it and turned it into what I think they were saying or what they could be saying. 
Mm. And that's really interesting, Gabby, when you said that, because what we think they're saying and what we may want to hear. Mm, yeah. As well. <laughs> you know, we, it's not easy to hear unpleasant experiences that mm. other people are having, especially if we've been working with them for a while. We may even regard them as a friend. We may not have realized that this was their experience in our workplace or in their community. In our community, we may not have realized that they were uh, experiencing these things. And that's why it's important to put aside our preconceptions about somebody, about groups, about cultures. Sometimes we have to put our preconceptions aside so that we can do the listening part as well. I mean, well, I had um, a conversation with you, didn't I? I think a couple of days ago, Shanti. And I was saying I was a little bit kind of upset about a conversation I'd had with somebody. And I'd actually made the assumption that they had meant something that they didn't because of previous conversations and interactions we had had, rather than seeing this as a new conversation and a new, um, a new topic or subject matter. I related everything that I thought about them previously to that conversation we had. And it took, it took a nice word of reflection to come back and say to myself and realize, that's that's really not what they were saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Take a step back, think and reflect. Um, so that's again how these biases and assumptions can come into place. Becoming consciously aware of those will be really useful when having and engaging in these conversations. Yeah, absolutely. And you know what, Gabby, thank you for sharing that. And I've had those experiences before myself. You literally can go off on a tangent internally. <laughs> and that might not be what the person meant or was trying to say. Um, and so, yeah, you're right. Taking that step back and thinking about, OK, what is it this person's trying to tell me? What are they trying to express? And, you know, sometimes instead of trying to figure it out by yourself, ask. I ask you. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think of this? You know, how could I see this differently? Is there something I'm missing uh, in this conversation? That's good. And then someone could help you understand their point of view a little bit better. Okay, so it's hard. This is stuff that we all have to practice as human beings. It's not easy to have hard conversations. And right now, one of the hardest conversations happening is about race. You know, particularly if you're in the US uh, and the UK, for example, conversations about racial discrimination, um, diversity are happening, okay? Um, they are happening, whether we like it or not. And it's a challenge to know how much to say, what to say, if to say anything, much less how sometimes our colleagues or friends, if they are of different races, might be feeling, mm. really. Uh, and so that important thing about approaching the conversation with respect mm. is important. OK. Um, and we're just going to make sure, by the way, we've been asked whether the slides will be shared. Absolutely. So we will send the slides, send the slides <laughs> <laughs> to, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, you can tell I'm tongue tied at the moment. We will send the slides so that you can ponder over these. You can reflect back at some of the codes that we've shared and be able to um, try and practice elements of those codes when you're having these conversations about mm. race. Now, mm. I don't know if you're feeling brave. Is there a question that you've got about race, about race equality that you'd like to ask? Remember, you can use the Q&A function and ask completely anonymously. We will not mention your name, okay? Here's an opportunity. Is there conversation or question rather, that you have about race, about race equality, about maybe the Black Lives Matter movement that you've seen on social media that you would like to ask. We're open. We're here to use that conversation code and, and maybe answer and help you with that question. Do let us know. Um, just on that as well, um, Ashanti, Yes. <laughs> These conversation codes actually work in all areas of life. You can start by practicing these on your friends and family before you take, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> take skills out to the workplace. It's yeah. going to benefit all relationships. Yes. Um, you know, and 
I don't know why that's just suddenly come to me, but it's quite an obvious thing. But you can practice these skills anywhere. <laughs> Absolutely. You're so right. You can wrote, you know, you can test them first. <laughs> <laughs> wrote, test them, yeah. Yes. Mm. See how they go mm. and then just see what, you know, people think and how they experience. Yeah, exactly. And, and Guillaume shared something as well, saying that thank you for giving this talk. Um, I feel like this sort of interactions and conversations are really needed in the tech field, especially seeing as computer science and tech are really lacking in diversity. And you guys being here and taking part in this session today yeah. and sharing your experiences is hopefully building that confidence and that awareness to bring it out into the wider field and start talking about this more in your organisations. The more people who talk, the more people who share, the more it's yes. becoming easier and easier and easier. And you start bringing everyone on board with you with this. So yeah. thanks yeah. for that. No, thank you. And I think, you know, you know, we thought very carefully about how we crafted this conversation uh, to make it relevant, to get the balance right between sometimes the heaviness of the conversation, um, but then also thinking about the usefulness of the conversation. You know, the fact that this conversation is happening on this platform is an act of allyship in itself because there'll be many individuals whose voices aren't being heard or they're not sure, they don't feel safe to speak up, to share their views. But this conversation alone mm. can do a lot of good. Ashanti, I've got a really good one here from, um, from Anna actually. Um, she was saying, I actually had a conversation with a friend um, about the professor that you, she spoke about earlier um, and took it as an example of sexism in tech. Um, and he, the friend, basically said, yeah, but, you know, this is just one guy. Um, <laughs> and she said, I feel like it's always just like one bad apple. We always say, oh, it doesn't matter. It's only one person. It's only one bad apple. And she's even said here that um, I made that mistake towards people who told me about racism, um, which is interesting that you've um, shared that with us. Thank you for being really honest there. So how can we communicate to others that social issues like these and systemic problems like these are not just individual ones? They are... Yeah. Unity, society issues. Yeah. Thanks. No, it's really good. And, and this is the thing, you know, one of the things that I often uh, think about is I am an able bodied person. So I don't experience life as in the way that an individual who might have a physical disability does. Right. And so, you know, I have to be aware of that as well. And, and maybe um, I may, it's in five years time, I could have a physical disability and then I will might look on that in a whole different way, right? Mm -hmm. So you're right, Anna, thank you for being so transparent. Sometimes we can forget other uh, inequalities, mm -hmm. you know, and the way we may have related to those inequalities before might change and we start recognizing we're experiencing one now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, this is an interesting question, though, Gabby, that we could discuss. How do we communicate that these are not just one-off experiences? Mm. <laughs> mm. You kind of communicated it a little bit previously, actually, yeah. <laughs> when you were saying that recognising um, that a particular um, area, um, such as um, talking about race or able-bodied people or our older, more mature communities or our youth. And because we don't experience those personally, uh, we find it difficult to sometimes empathise and take these things on board. But um, it's having that awareness, starting to become conscious about the way you think about things and see the world around you, um, I think. And I think that is something that's really happening now um, through globally, through every industry, through every sector, due yes. to what has come up over the past year or so. Um, so that is starting to happen and it is practicing and it's a skill that you are teaching yourself consistently. Um, and that skill that you learn, like the, how to have these conversations, how to show more empathy towards other societal groups, is something that you can pass on to others and share, yes. um, essentially. Yeah. That's awesome, that. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree with that. And, um, you know, just learning how other people experience life can just open up our eyes to realising that it isn't just a one-off experience. You know, sometimes we have to be open to learning about other people's customs, their traditions, their cultures, you know, and, and seek out that knowledge. 
seek out that knowledge because then we'll start to realize that it isn't just a one-off situation. There's not just a few people experiencing this. We can then bring the issue to life uh, and realize how widespread it might actually be. Mm. And Ava's made a good comment here as well about we all have biases and need to become aware of those and how can we use those biases? And actually that's really, um, really smart because as soon as you recognize the bias that you have, you then go and find out about why you have that bias. Read yes. up or about, about that particular group or person or circumstance that you, um, where you've kind of got that bias from. So actually it makes it quite easy for you. As soon as you, can, you can write a little list and go, right, what are my kind of biases and go yes. and take, take, do the work to go and actually search why and yes. use those thoughts processes. Good... Absolutely. Mm, yeah, so you. true, so true. Yeah. Um, so to, and, and this is a good time to discreetly think about what your biases are. You know, nobody yeah. has to even know at this point, you can discreetly think about, okay, what ideas and attitudes and beliefs might I have that may not be quite right? Okay, mm -hmm. um, that I could explore a bit further, that could mean that I see or treat this particular person or this group of people in a different way. Mm. I've been doing it lately with regards to age and assuming that a younger, this sounds really basic, but assuming that a younger person doesn't have as, as much experience of me because they haven't lived as much, haven't lived as long a life as me or been through what I've been through yet. And actually that's so wrong to make that assumption. And that's something, that's a bias and assumption that I've had that I'm working on the moment, ageism. Mm. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, that's a good one. That's a good one, isn't it? Um that is a good one because it can go either way as well, can't it? You can yeah. think someone's too old to do something. And we mm. see that in the tech industry a lot. And actually mm. age isn't a barrier to entering the industry and being really proficient and good at what you do. Um, and so that's a really good one, Gabby. Um, uh, you know, it requires us to be reflective. And again, the things that we're talking about here are these kind of conversation codes, reflection. So it's important to remember that when we go back to these um, elements in this code, it's not a linear process, it's a continuum. We will go back and forth, we will learn something, we will get it wrong, and then we'll go again. You know, it's, it's, um, it's managing our own expectations even of ourselves if we're in the learning phase and the fact that that learning never ends mm. and Stefan as well has mentioned here about systemic issues um, and obviously talking to people of a different age um, people have varying opinions <laughs> about the history and psychology of all of this but one positive I'd definitely say is with the future generations generations coming up generation Z coming up they are really all about social impact activism, ensuring that we live in an inclusive world and that we are there to support all diverse groups. So, yes. I mean, yeah, <laughs> historically, and maybe some people still have narrow-minded views, but I'm really hopeful for the future and our younger generation coming through that this is going to start changing for sure. And it will take time. It takes effort to really make impactful change, but I, I see it happening. So, Yeah, absolutely. You're right. So, um, again, younger generations feel differently, as you say. So that's yeah. something that we can, you know, draw comfort from, that younger generations want things to be different for everybody, regardless of who they are. And they're trying to work really hard to make sure that that happens in industries like the tech industry and in the workplace environment. Mm -hmm. Does anybody else have any more questions for us? Because we've gone through those key conversation codes. I'm going to review them briefly, but the slides will be shared. So you'll be able to refer back to them. The first one is curiosity. Uh, be open to learning about other people and asking respectful questions. The second one is keep it factual, either when you're sharing an experience or when you are being approached about an experience. Try to find the common ground, who, what, where, when. That can really help uh, the foundation of a conversation to you know, grow into something productive where the best outcome is reached. Think about whether the right people are a part of the conversation, okay? Are the right people in the conversation? Should this be conversation be public? 
Should it be a group conversation or should it be a one-to-one -one conversation? Does it need other people involved, i.e. a neutral person, a third party? Think about context and timing to get the best outcome. Reflect on the conversation. What is being said? What is the person asking for? What actions are required from you? And remember, you can reflect throughout all of these stages. It doesn't have to happen at the end or just at the beginning. Use reflection as a way to be more conscious and think about, okay, what outcomes are we looking for? How can I be the best ally I can be? And then the final one is feedback. Be open to feedback. Sometimes we might hear some things that we don't agree with, that we don't understand, that we can't relate to. And instinctively, we might become quite defensive, dismissive. Uh, we might shut down. We might respond with silence as well. Know that these are all natural human emotions and we just need to be aware of them, identify them, and work through those feelings so that we can provide safer spaces for us all in the workplace. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's a quick review of the conversation codes, okay, mm -hmm. and how we can have more productive conversations. Gabby is going to take us through um, where you can find more resources. Yeah, so actually before I do that, if you do have time over the weekend or any time of an evening, um, an opportunity for you to do some reflection for yourselves around this is think about if there's an uncomfortable conversation perhaps that uh, you have been avo um, avoiding, whether that is at work or even if that is uh, with friends or family, and how you would use these codes that we've shared with you today to approach these conversations. That if you have time, that's something that you want to take away and have a go at. Fantastic. Um, yep, yeah, so if you um, want some more from us, you can find us both on LinkedIn, as Shanti Ventil do and Gabrielle Austin Brown on LinkedIn um, or our LinkedIn page at Diversity Ally. You can also find us on Instagram at Diversity Ally. And head to our website, we have lots of resources there for you. We have a resource hub where you can find white papers, research, TED Talks, podcasts, everything if you're um, continuing your education. Um, or just feel, to, feel free to pop us a, a message by email. Um, and uh, we also have a guide as well. I forgot to mention that we launched that a week ago. So feel free to download a guide on our website um, and you might be able to use it, elements of it with your team um, in the workplace, your colleagues in the workplace. So yeah, and don't forget to listen to our podcast as well, um, which I'm sure you'll find some really interesting insights um, around how you can have these uncomfortable conversations and how we're moving the needle closer to diversity and inclusion globally, essentially. So thank you very much. Did I miss anything there, Ashanti? No, <laughs> no, not at all. Uh, thank you for joining us. We know that time is precious. Bye-bye.